All right, everyone. I apologize for the technical issues we had. I want to thank everyone again for joining today's live webinar. Um, my name is Rudy Nava. I'm the Global Director of Nutrition Exercise for Senogenics. And if you've attended any of our recent uh, webinars over the past couple of weeks, I thank you for joining and hopefully you can you find value in our information. Um, at the end of today's presentation, I will be asking for questions. And at that time, if you would like to offer any suggestions of new topics to cover, we are happy to consider them for future webinars. So for today, we are going to be talking about losing body fat as you age. So today, there are um, 45 and a half million adults in their 20s. And obviously, that presents a different set of challenges uh, when it comes to the health of the 22.6 million adults in their 70s, 37 million adults in their 60s, and also collectively over 80 million adults in their 40s and 50s. As we get older, we are presented with a new set of challenges as it relates to our health, whether our goals be losing weight, um, vitality, uh, sexual function, all of these things change over time. So today's purpose of our call and for our presentation is to see what kind of challenges we are facing as we get older um, that may be potentially overlooked when we are trying to lose weight, specifically body fat. So in the US, there are 93.3 million US adults considered obese via body mass index. Uh, for 20 and 30 year olds, so 20 to 40, um, over a third of U.S. adults are considered obese by these standards. Over 40% of adults in their 40s and 50s are considered obese, and over 40% of adults over the age of 60 are also considered obese. And these numbers also start to climb. Um, related conditions that are associated with obesity are heart disease, which is the number one cause of death in the United States, stroke, which is the number five cause of death in the United States, type 2 diabetes, which is the number seven cause of death in the, US, in the United States, and certain types of cancer, which are the second cause of death in the United States. Um, so when we look at the rate of preventable diseases and how many people have been diagnosed, over um, 28 million U.S. adults have been diagnosed with heart disease. Over almost 8 million U.S. adults have had a stroke at one point or another. More than 100 million U.S. adults are living with diabetes or prediabetes, and potentially more being undiagnosed. Um, and over 23 million U.S. adults have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, so while not all scenarios are completely preventable, um, in, in many cases, lifestyle can have a significant impact on managing these risk factors as we age. So when we talk about um, the increase in people being overweight and obese um, and, and trying to lose weight and trying to become healthier people, uh, we commonly turn to things in media, whether it be TV shows, uh, magazines, infomercials that are on late at night or early in the morning or the weekend. And they also always have a similar fitness personality associated with it. And the biggest thing that they mention on how to lose weight, that it breaks down as simple as calories consumed versus calories burned. Um, just like a bank account, you know, we can't save money if we're spending too much. Um, so while this is partly correct, um, there are some flaws to this simplification. And that's the purpose of today's call, because when we look at a lot of the things going on as we get older and a lot of the changes that we face through our biology, uh, we start to learn that calories in versus calories out or calories consumed versus calories burned is not the only story. Um, when it comes to weight loss, that can certainly be you know, a large component of it, not to discredit this thought process. Um, however, it is not the only thing going on and it is not the only thing responsible for fat loss. Um, versus just weight loss alone. So caloric consumption, to break that down, um, that's really anything that we eat or drink from a day-to-day -day period. Um, that's healthy foods, that's vegetables, um, everything has a caloric value. Um, calories are a measurement of energy, um, and that's different foods that we consume. Um, that can be water, sodas, wine, healthy food, unhealthy food. Um, what anything we consume is considered our caloric intake. Caloric expenditure um, in these magazines or in um, these infomercials or from the fitness personalities and interviews, caloric expenditure is always classified as exercise, which is not incorrect. However, it is only getting into the surface of energy expenditure or energy burned. So while everything that I've said so far is true, uh, calories in and calories out balance for weight loss, uh, there is more to the story, and again, this is the reason why we're getting on our call today, because there have been many people that have exercised and have watched their caloric intake 
and they've still struggled to see changes with their weight loss efforts. So when we look at some of the evidence with exercise and how it relates to weight change, um, there is strong scientific literature that suggests that exercise alone will not result in long-term sustained weight loss without an associated reduction in caloric intake. And the reason for that is because typically when someone exercises, we are burning more calories during that event. We're also burning more calories after exercise is completed. And our body is always fighting to maintain homeostasis. So if we are at a static weight and our weight has gone unchanged for quite some time, and we start to exercise, whether it be moderately or aggressively, the body's way to compensate for that and to prevent any kind of change in fuel sources as far as body fat and weight is to increase hunger levels. And commonly that can lead to overconsumption. Um, so overconsumption does typically accompany increases in exercise programs if it's gone unwatched. Um, exercise structure uh, for weight loss or weight gain, so depending upon your exercise programming, it must be intentional, it must be purposeful, it cannot be something that is just passively put together on the fly. It needs to be appropriate. It needs to be partnered with an appropriate nutritional influence, an influence that's either going to yield lean body mass maintenance or growth or sustainability, um, but also fat loss. So for nutrition, there is a number of things that we can also look at. You know, if exercise alone is not completely responsible for long-term weight loss in itself, nutrition is what we should typically be heavily relying on. You know, with exercise, we may only be exercising from 30 to 60, in some cases 90 minutes per day, whereas we eat multiple times per day on a day in and day out basis. So when we look at the macronutrients, we're talking about carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and also alcohol. Um, and one thing to remember with nutrition and the foods that you eat are that consumption or ingestion, everything that you put in your mouth, you chew up and you swallow, is not completely equal to digestion and absorption. Um, this is filled with a lot of different variables that can take place that can relate to food selection, how the foods are prepared, um, factors that are related to your intestinal absorption, and also individual genetic function. So digestion, for example, is influenced by fiber and also indigestible components. Um, think of it as um, a good thing to imagine is like apple skin. Apple skin is an insoluble fiber. It doesn't break down. So there is some caloric intake in there. Foods that have those types of fiber may not be uh, broken down and absorbed completely. So these forms create physical barriers that prevent our digestive enzymes from reaching all parts of the foods consumed. So by the time they go through our GI tract, they're actually passed and they might not be completely broken down. Um, there's also influence on the changes in the intestinal microbiome floral as we get over, and also diet composition. So, Again, going back to the calories in, calories out, a better way to look at it is that um, energy stored is going to be um, the remaining amount when we take our energy intake, the food that we consume um, and that we're actually absorbing and then subtract it from the energy that we output. And then that's the energy that we're gonna potentially be storing. And that's associated with our heat loss, our exercise, our activity, and also cooling. So aside from nutrition exercise, and we'll get back to nutrition exercise later in the presentation, but you know, what about some of the other factors? There are multiple things that we can consider as contributors um, to struggles we may have with losing body fat, and that's what we're actually gonna get into right now. So sleep, for example. Sleep, our focus on sleep for, as it relates to health and longevity, has significantly improved over the past decade. Um, I can say that it's probably still something that we are learning a lot about, and we don't really have a, as large of a grasp on it as we do, for example, with exercise physiology, um, nutritional sciences. Um, there's still a lot of things that we are learning about sleep as we get you know, more and more into the science. But there is a common misconception that less sleep is needed as we age. Um, I remember hearing that when I was younger and seeing my grandparents, um, which really isn't true. Uh, it's just as we get older, we get less sleep. And as we are adults, um, we tend to just accept the fact that we're sleeping less and we carry on and we have lower energy levels. Um, poor sleep hygiene um, can contribute to impaired first and second sleep cycles. And those two sleep cycles are necessary for the growth hormone secretion or the growth hormone release um, when we are sleeping. 
And that growth hormone is going to do many things for a body, not just fat loss over time, but for recovery and for longevity purposes as well. We're all aware of short-term sleep deprivation, whether it occurs from having a young child, um, working in a, in a tough environment from the medical side of things, first responders, um, even being in college, not sleeping, doing schoolwork. Uh, we all know the effects of short-term sleep deprivation from impaired attention, uh, memory issues, having difficulty concentrating, and also just quality of life within that short amount of time. Um, but as we carry on day by day, uh, week by week, month by month, and also year over year with sleep deprivation now it becomes chronic and long term, we're actually significantly increasing our morbidity and mortality. Uh, we are increasing our obesity and also type 2 diabetes rates, um, increasing heart disease risk factors, and also the potential for depression. So sleep is something that is of extreme value uh, in a weight loss program and also a fat loss program not only because someone is engaging in a structured exercise program and they need to recover from to continue the exercise program week over week, um, but just in general, if we are not recovering, we're not allowing our brain to rest, we're not allowing our body to rest, we're not getting the hormones that our pituitary gland is releasing, and that's gonna, over time, cause us to store more body fat and increase those risk factors of disease as we get older. Stress is another large contributor to potential issues with weight loss as we age. Um, cortisol levels rise in response to stress. Um, and that can be physical stress, that can be emotional stress, um, that can be psychological stress, we'll throw everything in. Um, cortisol is our stress response. Now for someone who is exercising aggressively, take for example, your weekend warrior you see at the gym or a amateur level bodybuilder, some guys that just like to work out, women that like to work out pretty hard, they are commonly um, not overtrained, but they are putting a physical stress on their body enough that cortisol levels may be on the high end of normal for the spectrum. Um, that's a normal cortisol response. However, if things start to go overboard with exercise and they start to increase training sessions, increase intensity, increase duration of exercise, and all of the things like recovery and sleep go unchecked and are now unrelated to the balance with our exercise program, we will then start to see cortisol levels go into the far end of the spectrum, uh, which will be overproducing cortisol. Um, the same goes for someone who's chronically stressed out. If you have a high stress job, um, over time, your risk factors can significantly increase for uh, diabetes, um, heart disease, and many other factors. One of the big things is that increased cortisol actually contributes to an increased insulin response. And as you know from our previous webinar, insulin is our storage hormone that helps drive sugar from the bloodstream and into the cells of the body. However, if we start to increase our insulin release and we have a higher presence of insulin in the body, we'll start to then drop blood sugar, increase hunger rates, eat more than we need, and also have this high level of insulin in the body, which is going to cause us to store more of this glucose that we're consuming. Um, it can impact uh, potential weight gain in two ways. Um, and uh, that increased stress is also linked in changes in eating behavior. Uh, we're all familiar with the term comfort food, um, but I don't believe anyone can say that there's a comfort food that they can think of that is necessarily a completely healthy, nutritious food. Um, comfort foods are typically uh, highly dense uh, caloric foods. Um, when I say dense, a lot of times we think of nutritiously dense, whether it be like a like, like nuts or um, good lean proteins or fish or something that's high in essential fatty acids. But when I say dense in this case, it's more just calorically dense. Something that a small portion will actually yield a significant amount of calories and it's gonna be able to do that because of a higher fat intake. Um, these comfort foods also typically have a higher glycemic load, meaning that there is a larger carbohydrate amount in them. So it's gonna be hitting the bloodstream a little bit harder once it's digested and absorbed yielding a higher insulin response from the pancreas. There are also nutritional deficiencies. Um, again, these are things that can be associated with difficulties with losing weight. Um, these are what get in the media a lot because a lot of people aren't aware of this. Um, vitamin D deficiency, for example, can contribute to weight gain. Women with vitamin D deficiencies are actually more predisposed to weight gain versus women with normal ranges of vitamin D. Um, higher body fat individuals across all sexes were actually correlated with a low vitamin D level in a series of studies. 
And in addition to that, low magnesium is common in obese adults. Um, it's not necessarily saying that high magnesium levels are going to cause someone to lose fat. However, magnesium has, it does many things in the body, but one of the large things it impacts is that it regulates blood glucose, going back to that blood glucose and insulin relationship. Um, so changes where we see um, blood glucose being more loosely regulated, that can lead to insulin resistance over time. Um, another large one that people are deficient in is omega-3 fatty acids. Actually, nine in 10 people are deficient or insufficient in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, these fatty acids help manage inflammation, and they also regulate blood glucose. So there is a common denominator in some of these things we're going over. Um, additionally, uh, low fiber intake can potentiate gut issues and also inhibit nutritional absorption. Um, another thing unlisted that fiber intake, a higher fiber intake does, is that when fiber is consumed with carbohydrates that we eat, it actually is going to lower the glycemic index of that meal, yielding a more um, positive relationship for the pancreas for releasing insulin. Food sensitivities are another one. Um, food allergies and sensitivities trigger an inflammatory response in the body. Uh, Short-term and long-term consumption of these triggers can actually lead to acute and chronic inflammation, fluid retention, fatigue, joint pain, bloating, gas, really dependent upon the individual, um, these symptoms or these um, characteristics of this inflammatory response caused by food sensitivities and allergies can vary. Um, but over time, this damage, this inflammation in the GI tract can actually lead to a leak gut. And that causes food particles to be exposed to the gut's immune system, which is even going to further systemic inflammation. Again, if you were on uh, my recent discussion webinar, we talked about biomarkers and the measurement for systemic inflammation was our high sensitivity C-reactive protein uh, or cardio CRP for short. So that is another marker. So as we start to eat foods that we may be unaware or we're not picking up on the signs that we have a sensitivity to this food that's causing inflammation. And again, if we're eating it either on a daily basis or every other day basis or weekly basis, as the months compound and as the years go on, this inflammation can be significant and it can cause a significant issue with your health. Hormone management is another one. Um, hormone management uh, is important because it's, it's not just the most hormones you read of when you think of testosterone and estrogen and that kind of, um, in those realms. Uh, going back to insulin, insulin is a hormone, as I mentioned, it's a storage hormone. And excess insulin is one of the major culprits when it comes to uh, difficulty losing body fat levels as we get older. Um, changes in thyroid function also happen as we get older. Um, it affects one in five women. Um, in most cases, it's hypothyroidism. Um, one in 10 men are affected by changes in thyroid function. And that can cause a host of potential factors, um, not only for weight gain, but also for cardiovascular issues as well. Um, elevated cortisol levels, again, we talked about stress hormone and cortisol is a hormone. Um, so that can be damaging for our efforts in losing body fat. Excess estrogen can make things more difficult and also low testosterone. Um, and as we get older, we do commonly see reductions in testosterone from decade to decade. So uh, the purpose of this call too is how do we make these changes? You know, what foundational changes can we make? What kind of things can we implement to help you reach your goals for your fat loss efforts? So we're gonna get back into each one of these topics and see what we can implement to make the changes you're looking for to have you reach those goals. So how do we improve sleep? So we wanna improve our sleep hygiene. And our sleep hygiene is, think about it when we talk about like dental hygiene before we go to bed. We're gonna brush and floss our teeth, uh, maybe use mouthwash, um, it's just kind of something we do. If we're trying to optimize our sleep patterns every evening, um, we definitely want to look to either restrict, strongly limit, um, remove, I mean, you can use whatever term you want, but looking on a spectrum base, we want to reduce the amount of late night blue light stimulation as much as possible. Um, that's been linked to disrupting circadian rhythms and also disrupting pineal gland function, which is responsible for releasing melatonin in the body that's going to allow you to sleep well. Um, so if we look at it from an anecdotal response, if you look at um, you know people playing video games or on their phone late at night, they're having trouble sleeping in the evening and then they don't get good sleep and the next day they wake up and they're tired and they're tired early in the afternoon and it's a vicious cycle because it's a pattern, it's a repeated pattern of having this environment before you go to bed. 
Um, again, on the same spectrum level, we want to restrict as much as possible, limit, remove late night alcohol intake, as that can disrupt our circadian rhythms and our sleep function, and also our growth hormone release as we sleep. Uh, we also want to restrict, limit, or remove the late night food that we consume. Um, when we look at pancreatic function, um, as it relates to circadian rhythms, when the evening, when it's dark out, our pineal gland would typically release more melatonin to allow us to get into a better sleep cycles when we go to sleep. When this melatonin is released, typically it's not just sending it to our brain to relax and for our bodies to relax, but also our organs to relax. So really in the evening, if you have good circadian rhythms and consuming food very late at night, we can now have a pancreas that isn't reacting to the presence of glucose and the blood is strongly so our insulin response is going to be somewhat weak, and that could yield to higher levels of blood glucose for a longer period of time. So we're really functioning on a high level later in the evening, so to consume food could be disruptive. We also want to aim for optimal duration of sleep, roughly being seven to eight hours per night. Um, and sleep, as, as we look at aging and mortality and morbidity, there's a U-shaped relationship uh, of the duration of sleep to morbidity and mortality. So a U-shaped relationship means that either too little sleep or too much sleep is not good. It's the middle that we want to actually achieve, and that's roughly seven, eight hours. Yes, that can be shorter in some instances um, where we could optimize REM sleep within that pattern, but in efforts for the general population, seven to eight hours is ideal. Another thing not listed in here that we'll get into when we get to one of the other pages is that um, studies show that actually if you sleep less than six hours per night on a regular basis, even for only a week, you can actually reduce testosterone levels by 10 to 15 percent of your own testosterone production. So stress, so how do we manage stress? So we do want to optimize sleep duration by optimizing sleep hygiene. So how well we sleep can have a direct impact of how we manage our stress levels. So if we minimize blue light, we minimize alcohol, we minimize food intake, and we allow ourselves to sleep better, we can actually have a better stress response and handle stressors in our lives. That can be, again, the physical stress from exercise. If we are training hard and we are increasing our cortisol levels and our physical stress in our body, but we start to improve our sleep patterns that are now in relation to the intensity that we're exercising, we are now managing our stress better. Um, so exercising regularly is also a good thing. If someone is not exercising from, um, there's benefits for emotional stress. You know, if they have need an outlet to get energy out, um, exercise can also be appropriate in this scenario. And another thing that's picking up a lot over the past decade is the, for the past decade in the United States, um, is meditation or mindful breathing exercises. Meditation has been around for, you know, as far back as you can think of. Um, however, in recent years, there have been more and more uh, apps on phones that can aid in meditation. It's ironic uh, because we say not to use blue light or to be as far away from blue light stimulation as you can. Um, so using a meditation app is kind of contradictory. However, if you use the applications as tools to understand how to initiate meditation, how to engage in that kind of practice, and then slowly pull away from it, you can then start to implement that on a day-to-day -day basis without having that blue light stimulation. Nutritional deficiencies. So what can we do here? So we can obviously optimize vitamin D levels. Um, nutraceutical dosing is going to be individualized based on serum levels. So by looking at blood values of vitamin D3 levels, our physicians are able to prescribe a recommended amount of vitamin D to have levels in the upper ranges of normal. So while the, I believe the recommended intake, um, the standard recommended intake is 800 international units, it is not uncommon to see patients and users going into the 5,000 or even 10,000 international units daily. We also want to optimize magnesium levels. Um, with magnesium levels, if you go on Amazon and you Google magnesium supplements, you'll see many different products populate. And it's mag magnesium from citrate, magnesium glycinate, magnesium orotate, magnesium theonate. And the biggest thing to understand is that each form yields a different amount of elemental magnesium. And based on the form, it's going to actually affect the system a little bit differently. So for example, magnesium citrate in higher doses can be used for improving bowel movements, where magnesium theonate is actually gonna cross the blood-brain barrier a little bit easier. So depending upon 
where your magnesium levels are and how the symptoms are affecting you could be affecting what type of form you should be using. Uh, dietary consumption should come from uh, plant and animal sources um, in the most natural form. So if we're talking about nutritional deficiencies as it relates to omega-3 fatty acids, stepping away from the canola oils, um, the soybean oils or the different vegetable oils and focusing on your essentials uh, from extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, um, different nuts and seeds are gonna be more ideal. Also, when we talk about fats from animal sources like meat, eggs, fish, trying to choose things or as frequently as possible choosing grass-fed meats or wild game, um, wild-caught fish, and also barnyard eggs or eggs that have been fed flaxseed. Um, these fats, when they are consuming these types of foods and they are in this more of a wild environment and eating foods in their natural sources, they are producing more essential fatty acids in their foods. Foods that are more coming from grain-fed diets um, or from farm-raised scenarios and fed cheap food, um, those are going to be higher in omega-6s, which can then shift our omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, leading to more inflammation as we get older. Um, the other thing we want to do is that our core carbohydrate consumption should come from fruit and vegetables to ensure that we are optimizing our fiber and antioxidant intake so that we are not seeing nutritional deficiencies through either antioxidants, vitamins, or also fiber. For further food sensitivities, we want to always consume whole foods as much as possible and not processed foods. Uh, we talked about um, processed foods being very dense in calories in many cases, um, but because they're so dense, that means they're a smaller volume that you're actually going to be consuming. So as far as feeling full, it's going to be less likely with the amount of calories it's providing in such a small portion. If we consume whole foods, typically we're going to be getting a larger volume of food, which is going to keep us fuller longer, and also is going to be providing us with those micronutrients, um, vitamins, and minerals that we're aiming for. So again, proteins rich in omega-3 fatty acids, fiber, and antioxidant-rich carbohydrates. Um, if we are seeing sensitivities, whether it be from joint pain or from uh, sneezing or stuffiness or anything that we could relate to a sensitivity or allergy response, there are tests that Cenogenics can actually do on our patients that shows us what foods we are uh, reflecting a sensitivity towards and what foods we actually have a true allergy to. But in the event that you don't have access to that, I do suggest temporarily eliminating common food allergens from your diet for about three weeks and then slowly incorporating in one at a time over a period of a few days or even a week or so just to see if those symptoms start to go away and if they are increased again when you start to implement another food. So those common allergens are going to be gluten, dairy, eggs, corn, yeast, peanuts, and soy. So some of these foods, for, for a few reasons, we don't recommend uh, to be commonly consumed. But for most individuals that you know, can, don't have a poor response to dairy or they don't have a poor response to eggs, um, we, you can very well include it. However, we are seeing more individuals becoming more sensitive. Um, it's not the only thing that's going on. There are all these other things we're talking about. However, it's going to be highly individualized from what the recommendations would be. Uh, we also want to suggest the incorporation of a daily probiotic to increase healthy bacteria in the gut. Um, when we look at probiotics, again, if you were to go on online shopping and you just Google a probiotic, there's going to be a number of different products that are available. The big things that you want to look at are the CFU counts. Um, you want anywhere from a bare minimum, I'd say roughly um, 10 billion um, CFU count per day. Uh, Cenogenics, we utilize anywhere from 30 to 100 billion in many cases. And in some severe scenarios where someone with gastrointestinal diseases will actually use upwards of 350 CFUs. Um, fortunately, we, pay, uh, we, we have a very close relationship with our patients. We're communicating a lot. So we know when and where to start to either increase the amount of CFUs daily or decrease. Um, the other thing with probiotics is the strain. So the strain, based on the strain of the probiotic, it's going to be um, colonizing in a different part in the gut. So if you speak with your physician to see what kind of issues you're having through your GI tract, we hope to find the area that it's occurring and utilizing the strains that are going to populate in those areas. And hormone management. So if insulin, uh, elevated insulin is a large issue with losing fat as we get older, Obviously, improving insulin sensitivity is one of the big things we can do. 
And that's going to go back to what we discussed about choosing the right form of carbohydrates, primarily from the form of fruits and vegetables, and also exercising. Uh, we also want to regulate thyroid function. So in many cases with thyroid, bioidentical hormone therapy is commonly clinically indicated by the physician. Um, so not to, to disregard anything a physician would say. However, in some cases where you're maybe borderline, um, items like selenium, zinc, iodine, and the omega-3 fatty acids we've discussed can be helpful. Um, we also want to consider regulating the goitrogen consumption. Um, goitrogens are found in cruciferous vegetables. So while cruciferous vegetables are great to provide indole 3 carbonyl, which can yield um, anti-cancer benefits in many cases um, and anti-estrogen benefits in many cases, um, they do have components that can cannot be complementary to uh, poor thyroid health. So again, suggestions are individualized for the patient. We also wanna manage cortisol levels by optimizing sleep, as we mentioned. Um, we want stress relieving techniques in the form of either meditation or breathing. Uh, we also wanna consider um, adaptogenic nutraceuticals for adrenal function. So adaptogens are very interesting because um, they aid adrenal function, whether adrenal function is too low or too high. It helps with regulation. It doesn't have one direct action or not. It kind of helps neutralizes the effects and allow the adrenal gland to function a little bit better. Common ones that we are aware of, that many people are aware of, are ashwagandha, um, cordyceps sinensis, and that's actually one of the large reasons why we've entered um, cordyceps sinensis into the Senegenics pre-workout formula in efforts to manage the 100 milligrams of caffeine in there. So we're not overstimulating the adrenal function. We're actually going to help the adrenal function as well with those cordyceps. Uh, we want to manage estrogen levels. So by managing estrogen levels, we are going to talk about physician therapies based on the individual. But we also want to optimize gut health. So reducing inflammatory foods like sugar and alcohol, um, increasing our fiber and antioxidant intake is going to yield better gut bacteria. And we also want to optimize testosterone. So testosterone, again, could be in the form of bioidentical hormones prescribed by our physician if it's clinically indicated, but things like high intensity interval training, um, resistance exercise, optimizing our sleep, optimizing our gut health, our adrenal function, reducing inflammation, all of these things that we can do in our lifestyle alone can help improve our testosterone function. So the question is, um, do these things sound familiar? Um, many things are covered cross over into different areas and they support one another. Um, I like to think of it as um, the insides of a watch working together. One thing is not necessarily more important than the other. They're all equally important and they're all yielding a collective benefit for you. So in efforts to improve your health, improve your body fat levels, improve your risk factors as we get older, implementation of many of the things we discussed is going to yield the best benefit. That doesn't mean that we need to make a full-fledged jump onto the complete opposite side of the spectrum that we're currently on. The number one goal is to start taking those small steps forward in each of these avenues to start to see the health benefits and losing our body fat. So again, it's going back to nutrition. So protein consumption, we wanna have protein consumption rich in omega-3 fatty acids and also in its most natural form. Wild-caught fish, grass-fed red meats, uh, wild game, um, carbohydrate consumption in the form of fiber and antioxidant rich foods, primarily coming from your fruits and vegetables, um, relative to energy and our carbohydrate consumption, the volume of our carbohydrates we consume should be relative to our energy output and also our insulin sensitivity. Um, in the early stages of your body fat loss efforts, if your insulin sensitivity is poor and you have high insulin levels, there's, it's not overly beneficial to consume an excess amount of carbohydrates because you have a hard time metabolizing them off the bat. It would be potentially, again, this is individualized, but it would potentially be more beneficial to take a few weeks of carbohydrate restriction and limiting yourself to fruits and vegetables, having weight loss start to occur. You might start to see exercise performance start to slightly decline, but at that time, your insulin sensitivity should be improving and then you can slowly reintroduce more dense carbohydrates into your diet. Um, fat consumption, we want to emphasize again, omega-3 fatty acids is one of the popular words of our presentation today. Uh, plants like olives, so olive oil, coconut oil, nuts and seeds, um, the suggested protein sources I just made. Um, and alcohol consumption should be within individualized limitation. Going back to the spectrum, the spectrum analogy is that um, there's, we think that there's either 
a good thing and a bad thing in many scenarios. And that's not really a way to do things every single meal, every single day, every single week. You want to look at the spectrum and the frequency. If we can slowly move towards the more positive end of the spectrum, gradually over time, we can make more sustainable changes over our lives, um, which is going to yield a much significant benefit for our risk factors as we get older. So one thing that's, I think, interesting for people to hear is that you can be overfed and undernourished. So the overconsumption of poor foods can cause nutrient deficiencies. So if you are consuming a lot of processed foods, a lot of simple carbohydrates, um, a lot of poor fats, trans fats from processed foods, you can be eating a lot of calories and overfeeding yourself and gaining weight, and gaining body fat, but you can be heavily undernourished due to the lack of micronutrients, essential fatty acids, protein, all these things that we're talking about, antioxidants, fiber, you can be heavily undernourished due to the food choices you make. So the amount of food that you should be consuming appropriate for your fat loss needs to be going or getting selected from foods that are going to be providing these vitamin rich uh, fields. With exercise, we want to incorporate all three modes of exercise being cardiovascular, resistance, and flexibility. Cardiovascular exercise can range from high intensity interval training, which is going to yield um, a little bit more bang for your buck for um, the effects that happen after exercise. Low intensity steady state cardiovascular exercise is also uh, good. It can be implemented if someone has injuries or they're just uh, starting their fitness journey, starting to lose body fat. Uh, resistance training, we want to structure the program for individual needs, goals, and interests. Um, everyone's different as far as where they're starting. Everyone's different from what kind of uh, historic past they've had with exercise, but specifically resistance training. Um, so it's going to be dependent upon what they can do. And also lifestyle is going to determine a big part of the program, and this is what we do for our patients. You know, some patients may have uh, very high travel schedules. They could be emergency medicine physicians. Um, so the amount of frequency, the duration of each training session, and how much volume of work they can get done within each training session is going to vary significantly based on the amount of time allotment we as nutrition exercise team members get. So when you're developing your own program, you want to see what are realistic goals that you can set for yourself and then build the program within those windows. Um, flexibility is also going to be based on individual risk factors and movement patterns. One of the tests that we perform on our patients during their evaluations are a functional overhead squat assessment and a forward hold assessment. And we also look at movement patterns when we do our exercise testing. Looking at this information and having a visual aid to see how our patients move and operate allow us to potentially predict injury and risk factors associated with resistance training or cardiovascular exercise. So we want to make sure that we can offer flexibility tools and suggestions that can help reduce some movement pattern issues and improve overall mobility. And there's more than just exercise when you're exercising too. So um, that kind of goes back to the whole scale that a lot of things are overlooked when we talk about this is that um, there's total energy expended and that's gonna be made up of really three things. That's our resting energy expenditure. So that's if we were just to be at rest and how many calories we're burning. So that's based on body size, specifically more on muscle mass, so body composition, um, and our recent energy imbalance. So if you exercise for high intensity interval training, maybe 12 hours beforehand, that could influence your resting energy expenditure right now. Um, your active energy expenditure, which is going to be actually during exercise or when you are training for that day, and also the thermogenesis. Um, and then lastly, the thermic effect from food. Um, so the digestive process actually burns calories as well. So when you eat foods, um, they are going to yield a digestive process that's going to burn calories. And protein, the metabolism of protein and breaking that down and utilizing that, is actually going to have a higher cost of energy, meaning that it's going to be causing you to burn more calories than it would be when you're breaking down other foods. Um, so lastly with exercise, one thing to remember too for your fat loss efforts is that Exercise is a stimulus that is used to cause an adaptation. And that stimulus is only going to be good until you've adapted. And once you've adapted, that stimulus is no longer stimulus anymore. So from there, we need to recreate that stimulus. We need to recognize when that's happened. We need to make a new appropriate stimulus. And that's why exercise programs are commonly progressive. People can go from two days a week of resistance training to three days a week of resistance training in the next, in six week time period. From there, they can go from 
10 total work sets performed to 12 total work sets performed. They can go from 30 second rest periods to 15 second rest periods. There's a number of ways to change the stimulus to cause continued adaptation. Um, and again, it's just recognizing when you need to implement that. And lastly, I want to say that when health, I want to use a quote from uh, Heraclitus. Uh, he's a uh, ancient Greek physician who was actually um, recognized one of the first to study anatomy. And he said that when health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself, art cannot manifest, strength cannot fight, wealth becomes useless, and intelligence cannot be applied. So we need to recognize that as we age, we come, we are faced with these different challenges with our health. We may not recognize them in their 20s or even our 30s, but they begin to compound. By the time we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and later in life, we really can see that we maybe missed the mark on where we should have acted. So just like a savings account, it's always better to start younger, but it's never too late to start. So with that, um, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. Please feel free to use the webinar tools to ask them. Um, and uh, I'm open to any questions you guys may have. So one of the questions we have is, um, why does stress tend to change eating patterns? And it's almost like an emotional defense mechanism. Uh, when we eat, there are different hormones that allow us to either calm down or feel good hormones that are released. And that can affect us um, kind of managing stress. It's always a short-term, um, it's always a short-term fix. It's never something long-term, um, however, it's, it's certainly there, and I think we've all experienced it. Um, how can the Cenogenics program help somebody that is really addicted to sugar? Uh, so the Cenogenics program, for someone who's addicted to sugar, uh, which many people are, um, I'm going to be honest that it's not an easy road. Um, you know, really the biggest thing that I think is going to change of whether you're, you're feeling about sugar is that when we actually do your testing and we look at your blood work, and we look to see how it's affected your body composition, and we see how it's affected your inflammatory response in your body. Um, it's it's a pretty large wake up call for a lot of our patients to see that they are you know on the road to type two diabetes. They have forty percent body fat in the waistline, which is that visceral fat and the fat that's around the organs. Um, and and it, it's a large wake up call. And to see that one of the largest things that could be causing that is an excess sugar intake or excess you know poor carbohydrate intake um, many times that can be an intrinsic motivator for our patients additionally they're not just on their own you're not just going to be getting lab results and getting um, told of how fat you are from your dexa scan um, you have a team around you that are going to be providing ongoing support from your physician to your nutrition exercise team member to your service coordinators to Cenogenics blogs that are available, to our, our email distributions that go out as far as food recipe items. Um, there's a lot out there for you to help support that. Um, but again, I think the first part is the wake up call and the second part is the support you have and that's why our patients are successful. So how can Cenogenics help with a patient that has meat food allergies? And the first thing we need to do is we need to actually run the testing. Um, we can do an elimination diet that can certainly be helpful, um, but then we will test for actual true allergens. If there are true allergens, we will remove those from the diet. And then we will look at the food sensitivities. And our sensitivities, we can actually test upwards of close to 180 or more different foods for a uh, sensitivity response. And looking at those responses, we will see on a scale of how aggressive they are or not. Um, and based on that, we will actually pull them from the diet and implement other foods and then almost use a similar to what I mentioned earlier is that we would rotate in, you know, the foods after a few weeks, see if it responds in um, and see if that inflammatory process is actually just from overconsumption. And as we start to implement them uh, less frequently, that can be beneficial. 
Um, do you have any tips for busy people? Uh, many of our patients are very busy individuals um, based on, from what I hear when our patients come into the office. Um, again, they can either be business owners or physicians or attorneys, and um, they all have their limitations in how much they can exercise. And in an ideal scenario, someone who is clinically healthy but um, deconditioned, unfit, um, maybe they haven't exercised in a while, maybe they're on a blood pressure medication or a cholesterol medication, um, you know, these are someone who, again, are clinically healthy, they're just deconditioned and untrained. We can start them right off the bat in many cases with high intensity exercise uh, being the interval training because if we start to utilize their results from their VO2 max tests and give them their target heart rates based on our Cenogenics philosophies, we can actually cause them to increase their caloric expenditure, not only during exercise, but for 24 to 48 hours afterwards. Um, we we'll also take advantage of shorter rest periods with resistance training, anywhere from rest periods anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds uh, in between training sets are associated with higher growth hormone output. So if we do have patients that have um, healthy pituitary function are releasing growth hormone levels at a natural rate, utilizing that type of rest period for their resistance training, those shorter rest periods, those shorter windows, we can actually maximize that and they can have a really positive response over time for changing their body composition. How important is it to avoid gluten, as there are more and more products advertised as gluten-free? So um, these are kind of twofold, and this one's actually a, a kind of personal for me. Uh, my wife is actually uh, diagnosed celiac disease, um, which is fairly new. So if someone is celiac um, and they actually confirm celiac disease, gluten can be, you know, it can really offset a lot of allergic reactions. Um, similar to flu-like symptoms, joint pain, um, it's, it's significant, and I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, now, there are more trends going on where things are gluten-free because larger amount of people are more sensitive to gluten or maybe they're just afraid of gluten because they see it in media or their favorite celebrity did a gluten-free diet and they lost weight. Um, it's not something that many people will absolutely need to refrain from, but since most gluten-based items are more simple carbohydrates, um, removing them and consuming more vegetable-based carbohydrates or fruit um, is over time, meal after meal, day over day, week over week, going to have them consuming more fiber, having them consume more antioxidants, um, having them remove a lot of those denser carbohydrates. So calorically over time, you can see a reduction and you also see an improvement in the micronutrients coming into the body. So it's not that eating gluten-free for everyone is the most necessary thing. However, for someone who eats nothing but you know, strong amount of gluten products and they start to eat more fruits and vegetables and more protein things there, they can certainly see the benefit just from that change. Um, to purchase the probiotics, do I have to be a patient with Cenogenics? Um, probiotics are not prescription drugs. They can be purchased online. Um, we do have an online store via Cenogenics. It's cenogenicsstore.com where we do sell some of our probiotic formulas. Um, we do have a number of different options available to patients, and I believe there are also available options to consumers on the online store. Um, the best way to actually get the right dosing is to be able to speak with one of our physicians through an elite health evaluation program where we can look at your food diaries, um, look at any kind of food allergies and sensitivities, um, look to see what kind of digestive issues you're having as we speak with a physician during one of our consults, maybe even get collected uh, information from a physical exam. And then based on that information, we can actually see what type of strain that's more specific to you and what quantity is a little bit more appropriate. That doesn't mean that you can't buy probiotics. Um, it just means that we would be um, being a little bit more accurate with the first initial uh, dose and product for you. Um, could you please explain how the program can help achieve health? So there's many ways that the Cenogenics program can achieve optimal health. Um, as I mentioned, you know, health isn't measured in just one facet or not. It's just not a, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a, it's not a singular thing. Health is a comprehensive thing. There's, there's multiple avenues, there's multiple ways to get it, but all the efforts need to be in place collectively. Um, you know, it comes from the foods that you eat, the exercise that you perform, 
how well you're sleeping, how well you're managing stress, how we're managing hormones, and all of those things feed into each other and it becomes this cyclical pattern and each, each effort feeds into the next. Um, you know, if we optimize testosterone in a patient with low testosterone levels, not only will they be able to exercise more aggressively and train better and recover better, they will also sleep better, they're gonna reduce their disease risk. Over time, those efforts with exercise and those efforts with their sleep and their nutrition are gonna help them reduce their body fat. Um, so it's, it's a very synergistic approach. So in my uh, biased opinion, Cenogenics helps achieve health, you know, in really almost every way you can think of. Um, you know, we offer so many things to our patients whether it be from clinical testing to support from a physician, support from a professional team, um, you know, ongoing access to nutraceuticals. Um, and it's just, it's, it's really, it, it's impressive the things that we can do for our patients. Um, what is the difference between vitamin D and vitamin D with K2? So that's more of a nutraceutical question. Um, Vitamin D as a nutraceutical is strictly just something that can change vitamin D3 levels in the serum. Um, there has been a trend in the market and with a reason that actually optimizing um, the nutraceutical by including vitamin K2, um, in many cases in the form of patented MK7, can actually help reduce um, atherosclerosis development and vascular disease risk better than just D3 alone. So while D3 is taken, so while vitamin D is taken for a number of things, whether it be for inflammation or for bone health um, or for cardiovascular health. When we partner that with K2, we can actually get a host of additional benefits. Um, so that's why in many, for a host of additional benefits for almost any user. So that's really one of the reasons why we've actually started to implement more vitamin D3, K2 combinations for our patients versus just a standalone vitamin D3. Um, is there a greater risk of injury in starting to exercise before you have lost some weight? Um, there's always a, there's always going to be a risk of injury doing anything. Uh, it's really having the correct guidance and implementation. So if you have if you don't have a strong exercise background and you have a significant amount of weight, um, if that significant amount of weight on you is giving you limitations in your mobility and you have joint pain, um, and you put together a program that would be used in you know, college football programs, the likelihood of you getting injured is very high. However, it doesn't have to be that way. If you have a large amount of weight to lose, you have mobility issues, you can actually you know, start to pick the low hanging fruit. I mean, going back to the spectrum philosophy is that you don't need to be all the way on the other side of the spectrum to see benefits. Really, you can make small steps towards that side um, either every day, every week, every month. It really doesn't matter as long as you're progressing. So someone who does have a large amount of weight to lose, they can actually start to see significant fat loss and weight loss with the smallest initial changes in their lifestyle. It's just like picking low hanging fruit. Um, if you go from being completely sedentary to, you know, starting to, you know, walk a little bit more, maybe 20 minutes a day. And then after two weeks, you start to go 30 minutes per day. And after that, you start to walk up a hill for 20 minutes a day. You have this progressive change. Over those periods of weeks, you're moving closer to the positive end of the spectrum and you're progressively making that exercise a little bit harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder, and the body's response to that will be to change. So yes, you can start an exercise program, um, but you can have an increased risk of injury if you are utilizing the, an inappropriate exercise program, but that's the case for anyone. An advanced trainee in Olympic weightlifting um, could very well have a high injury risk if they start to implement a highly advanced, you know, powerlifting program that's programmed for someone who's a super heavyweight. It's, it's no different. Uh, what would happen if one only ate chicken, white fish, and egg whites instead of grass-fed beef and fatty fish? Um, that goes back to, you know, having actual nutrient deficiencies even when consuming quote-unquote healthy foods. Um, so grass-fed beef and fatty fish are going to yield high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids like we mentioned. Um, whole eggs as well. Uh, if you're eating the yolks, they are loaded with choline, B vitamins, a lot of different things. Uh, whereas if you're only eating egg whites, you're only eating very lean protein sources, um, white fish. Um, now those can be strategically used. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Like if I had egg whites and then I wanted to add avocado slices, which is a good source of healthy fats, um, you know, that's better than just the egg whites alone. 
um, really, in, in my opinion, for overall health and wellness and optimization, essential fatty acids in the form of omega threes on a consistent basis are going to be very important for longevity and for cellular health, and they should be regularly implemented over just non-fat items like white fish, white meat, chicken, and also egg whites. The only time where I would strongly, not strongly, but the only time where I would be agreeable with implementing some of those really lean foods that are 100% only protein is in the event that you have a strength athlete or physique athlete like bodybuilding who is dieting down for a show and taking their dieting to really the most extreme levels of going from, you know, a, a healthy body fat, anything, a healthy body fat for men is considered anything under 20%. Um, 12 to 15 percent you could classify as someone who's maybe like a like an athlete um you know maybe like a wide receiver or a tight end or running back they're gonna be made like the 10 percent range um bodybuilders that are on show that are like on stage where you see in these fitness magazines they're probably anywhere from like three and a half to four or five percent body fat the only time i would recommend someone focusing heavily on those super lean proteins would be in the event that they're trying to go from like a 6% body fat to a 3.5% body fat and so that they can really structurally manage their fat intake and their caloric intake so tightly. However, this is these recommendations are fringe. Um, you know, so that's why it's it's important to not get nutrition information from like fringe level athletes because it doesn't totally apply to the scenarios that a lot of patients are in and it can start to develop poor habits over time. You know, if someone listens to a competitive bodybuilder who's dieting the last six weeks to a show and they're implementing these foods because they said so, and now this person who's just a regular guy, a regular girl who are just trying to eat well, um, and they start removing these healthy omega-3 fatty acids, they'll start to see changes in their skin. They'll start to notice it in their joint health. That can be disruptive to their menstrual cycles for women. Um, you can start to see significant, you know, changes in hormone production. You know, fats are derived, fats have cholesterol and and our sex hormones are actually derived from our cholesterol. So when you start to remove all of these good fats and the good essential fatty acids and dietary cholesterol, we actually see reductions in hormone production as well. Um, what are your thoughts on using supplements even if we're eating healthy or think we are? Um, so supplements, I always say that supplements are to supplement the gaps that we may be missing. Um, so really, in, in a best case scenario, you would look at your blood work, you would look at your micronutrient potential deficiencies or insufficiencies, you would look at your food allergy and sensitivity testing, and you would see what your major issues are. Um, if you look at your food logs and see that this makes sense, why I am deficient in this or why I'm insufficient in this because I don't eat these foods ever, my suggestion would be to first then implement those foods. If those foods are implemented regularly and now you are having a balance of micronutrients and phytonutrients in your body from whole food sources, from really good quality natural sources, and if that optimizes those levels for a follow-up test, I don't believe that nutraceuticals in that case are completely necessary if you're just trying to fill in certain gaps. Um, however, if the food sources you're having, it's just they're lower in phytonutrients, they're lower in micronutrients, and even with your food efforts, you still need support. At that time, I would absolutely recommend nutraceuticals. Um, as it as nutraceuticals relate to sports performance or exercise performance, um, myself, I am a, a large proponent for that. They are, again, though, they are not completely necessary. For you to exercise and have a great 60-minute resistance training session is not solely dependent on the use of a sports performance product. However, if you are exercising and you are trying and you're eating well and you're sleeping well and you're doing all of your core functions 100% or even 90%, you know, that their focus is there and you want to take it potentially to the next level, I do believe that sports nutrition like post-workout protein, um, pre-workout support, um, different things along those lines can, can really offer a lot of benefits. Um, one thing that I really like is our Cenogenics pre-workout formula. I know I mentioned it earlier on this presentation. We have an ingredient that's called peak ATP, and we have it included at the studied dose. So this is a good example of why you can exercise on your own and see great benefits, but also there are some supportive ingredients that can make it even better, is that with peak ATP, they had a group of 
of men and women that were resistance trained perform their squat and find the heaviest that they could squat. It's called their one rep max. And from there, they separated the groups into two and had them perform 80% of that weight um, to failure over four sets. The group that did not do any nutraceuticals, they just performed 80% of their squat rep max. They averaged um, around 40 total reps over four sets. So that's great. Like four sets of 10, if we break it down that way, they probably were like maybe like 15, 12, 10, 8, something along those lines. And then the group that used the peak ATP that we have in our Cynogenix Power pre-workout formula, they actually took 80% of their squat weight and they performed 50 reps on average. So they were able to achieve about 25% more training volume with an equally difficult load, so an equally difficult training intensity. They did 25% more of that. So if you look at that and you break it down over someone who's exercising three days a week um, over you know, we don't want to put a time length on it, but let's see what kind of changes you can make in 16 weeks or even a year if you're training 25% more volume with every single training session. You're going to be able to achieve those goals a little bit faster. It's not magic. Um, it's not like you're, you know, threefold increase in your strength. However, that's what I, I believe true supplements that are beneficial for, for patients and for consumers are ones that are giving you just a little bit of push and that you can sustain that and it still takes work on your end to make it happen. All right, guys, so I really wanna thank you for all of your questions, they were fantastic. Um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation today. Um, and again, if you have any further interest, please know that Cenogenics offers free consultations um, to those interested in our Cenogenics programs. So if you are interested in learning more, go to cenogenics.com and register and you'll speak with one of our teams and get connected with a health get connected with one of our physicians. So again, thank you for your time today and I will see you at our next webinar.